So within Guardian, I introduced this a little bit earlier today, but um, we had gotten our start in newborn screening with our first pilot study uh, for SMA in 2016. And with that, I guess there were a lot of lessons learned for me. Um, number one is we worked very closely with the New York State Department of Health and with Michelle Kajan and her team. And we did it really with the idea that this was a newborn screening pilot um, from newborn screening blood spots, but consented as we did everything. And so there were a lot of lessons learned from that that I'll just say have informed over time the other things that we've done. And you'll see that common thread coming through. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through uh, what I went through earlier in terms of doing this, but just to say that this was very straightforward in terms of we were looking for the common mutation. It was a completely straightforward assay from a genetic or a genomic point of view in comparison to what many of us have been talking about at this meeting. Um, but yet, as I said, it was novel at the time in terms of not meeting those WHO criteria uh, for something that was treatable, readily treatable, although it was at this interesting interface. Um, and as I said at the time, uh, there was an ASO trial that was ongoing. And as we did this, we really got this in a way that I'm very proud of in terms of being scalable and being able to, uh, in, in this consented process, have very high uptakes. And so as an example, um, for individuals that were approached for this study, we had 93% of parents that decide that they wanted to be part of this. Uh, the small number of parents who said they didn't want to be part of this, many of them said things like, I gave it the office, i.e. I got screened prenatally and so that they thought they were covered already. Uh, and a certain number of people who said they just didn't want to be part of research and that obviously is okay as well. Um, this is one of the uh, sort of videos that makes me happiest um, because this was our uh, first baby who was identified to be predicted to be a type one baby. That is, she had two copies of SMN2, uh, no SMN1. And her parents uh, are teenage parents, or, or they were at the time, actually, teenage parents, Latina, um, an under-resourced family. Um, I can imagine that the time she would have come to clinical attention and diagnosis would have been actually quite late in the disease in terms of when an ASO treatment, even if she had found her way in terms of diagnosis and being part of a clinical trial, uh, likely too late in terms of when she would have benefited from treatment. So instead, and in contrast, uh, she was immediately diagnosed within a uh, the first two weeks of life, given the opportunity in terms of the ASO trial. And these were her home videos from 14 months of life. Uh, and again, just as a reminder for those of you who don't think of this, um, more than 50% of type 1 babies will be unfortunately six feet under in terms of the natural history by their first birthday. Um, and so this is really a remarkable difference. Um, in contrast, and this is what brings me equally as much sadness, uh, is we did have one baby who we didn't get a chance to approach. They just managed to get discharged before we were able to offer them the study. And I actually made that diagnosis with Michelle actually from the newborn screen blood spot, but after the baby died. Um, and when she came to me clinically in terms of trying to understand uh, why they had lost that child, and we went back and were able to identify that it was because of SMA. Uh, but that to me shows just really what can happen literally uh, concurrently in the same time um, when we do and when we don't have individuals who have access to this. So from an equity point of view, this became very, very important to me to make sure that however we did this, we did something that was equitable and that we didn't leave anyone behind as we were doing it. So this is, um, and I always say it starts with a patient and ends with a patient for me. And so this was a, a little girl that I, um, and this is actually not her picture, uh, this is just a representative child, but she came to me at eight years of age uh, when she'd had uh, eight years of intractable epilepsy and unfortunately intellectual disabilities as a result of that. And she came to me clinically, and at the time this was the relatively early days of things like exome sequencing, uh, and it became very readily apparent uh, when we looked at her exome that she had a mutation in a glucose transporter, a de novo mutation. Um, and with this, a relatively simple fix in terms of starting a ketogenic diet, her problem was being able to transport glucose across the blood brain barrier, such that she was chronically hypoglycorrhagic or had a low CSF glucose. And unfortunately, no one had done a lumbar puncture to be able to detect that. And so she had not been diagnosed. Um, and with that, it really made me uh, ask the, myself the question, well, we diagnosed her at eight years of age. We started immediately her ketogenic diet. She responded beautifully, uh, is seizure free in terms of that, but her intellectual disabilities are not reversible at this point. So she remains disabled and will be for life. Um, but it really brought to bear to me, well, what if we had diagnosed her not at eight years of life, but had it been eight weeks, eight days, but you know, had it been something more in uh, sort of in our spirit of newborn screening, 
if we had been able to do it in that way, I'm absolutely convinced she and the next generation uh, would have and will have a different outcome. And so it was really thinking about paradigms like that that are not amenable to the kind of uh, screening that we can do. We're, we're not going to go around and doing lumbar punctures on all the babies, you know, before they get discharged. So what is scalable in terms of an other, uh, another orthogonal method that we can use for the diagnosis? So in then comes um, about three and a half years of uh, planning that we've been doing in terms of thinking about what would the next wave of newborn screening be. Um, we had finished the SMA newborn screening study, and I'm very proud to say that was foundational in terms of the rust application. And for those of you who don't know, SMA is now on the recommended universal screening panel and implemented in almost all 50 states. Uh, we've since, with a consortium, gone on to do DMD, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and concluded that study. Um, and uh, very, very important knowledge that's uh, very helpful in terms of CK now as a different method in terms of screening and now on to really the most expansive and, and potentially most impactful. So the beauty, I, I always say, if you can do it in New York, you can do it anywhere. Um, and that's because in terms of thinking about this, we've really got an amazingly diverse from an ancestral point of view, uh, really a melting pot of the world. And so this is just to show you the demographics. When you think about a New York City population based on US census data, we're really, really, um, very, very um, wonderfully mixed in terms of thinking about that. I'll also say uh, it's also more challenging, and I think in the early days of doing uh, sequence interpretation is going to be more challenging uh, for our community in New York, but uh, yet we're still committed to doing it. And so the garden study that I'm uh, talking about is really uh, trying to reach 100,000 individuals within a relatively short period of time that's representative and is uh, based in terms of the same way that we do newborn screening. Um, that is that from a process point of view, which I'll get to in just a second, um, using those newborn screen blood spots uh, so that there's no additional burden to the baby as we're doing this. As we started this process, um, I always start with the parents in terms of listening to them. And so we brought back parents who had been part of previous newborn screening pilot studies that we'd done and asked them uh, both in terms of surveys as well as in terms of focus groups, um, just what it was they'd want if we wanted this next step, would they want it? How would they want it? And every step of the way in terms of doing this, as others have said, really have engaged them within that process. Um, and so as we've done this, uh, you know, it was very clear they didn't want this to be any additional burden on the baby. So no extra pokes, no extra blood samples if we could avoid doing that. Um, they're, uh, as a generation, you know, fine with online types of things. That didn't bother them in terms of doing that, although they did like the idea of being able to talk to someone. Um, and for some of them, thought that it might take a little time for this to sort of marinate in their heads and some time to think about it and make an informed decision. And so we've built in all of these parameters in terms of the study design for Guardian. So as some others have said, uh, we understand that there's more involved in this than there was for SMA or DMD. And so we've started this and, and we are live in terms of doing this. I'll show you some data at the end, uh, but we introduced this in the third trimester to the within the obstetrician's offices. So as they're getting information, for instance, about lactation or about epidurals, this is part of the packet that they get preparing for delivery. Um, we have websites, um, QR codes, emails, phone numbers, every way of being able to get in touch with study staff when they want to. Um, and then we actually approach them in the postpartum uh, uh, maternity floor with a direct face-to-face -face contact with research assistants who speak multiple languages who are from the community themselves uh, to be able to talk to them about the study and then we have just a tablet-based e-consent and they get a copy of that consent afterwards. Um, as others have said, we've built in the iterative process within this. We clearly acknowledge that we're going to be learning in this, and so we've built in that expectation. Uh, what I call V1 or version one of the genes that we're doing are about 250 genes. I'll get into that a little bit more, but we already have selected the genes for V2 or version two. Um, within this, we wanted to make sure that we could actually do this and do the data interpretation uh, on a scalable way, um, because when we're talking about doing something like 100,000 babies, for instance, in the next four years, uh, we need to be able to really roll through this. And so uh, we envisioned a ramp up period with this. And like I said, both smaller in terms of number of participants and number of genes at the beginning. Um, at the beginning, we also wanted to be able to set reasonable expectations. So a turnaround time of three to six weeks, hoping that with time as we progress, we'll be able to you know, sort of get that farther and farther down. The ultimate goal, um, ultimately, if we can reach it, would be to have this in the same time frame that we do regular newborn screening. But we realize that's a tremendous, at least uh, investment in terms of 
infrastructure to be able to do that. And as we've done that, um, I'll get into it in a second, but it doesn't end with the diagnosis. So I said it before, but it's not diagnose and adios. It's really the beginning of a longer journey. So we've prepared a lot of materials in terms of all of the action sheets, all of the specific subspecialty groups, uh, training those doctors, making sure they're ready to onboard these new babies when they come in, uh, having navigators to help families. But we've tried to really be responsible and think about that even before launch. So this is just a picture of the website. Um, and as we do this, um, we do have a, a wonderfully diverse community. So as we've done this, we started out with Spanish and English. We started adding Chinese and Russian and other languages as well as we're doing this. Um, we've been, uh, I think, really intentional in terms of the videos that we've developed, uh, making them very, very accessible. If anyone wants to go on the website and borrow anything, feel free. Um, but, um, you know, sort of really understandable with the key points and iterated several times in terms of being able to do that. So within this, uh, some people have talked about choice, and we are doing a bit of an experiment in terms of that choice. Uh, so the group one conditions would fulfill the WHO criteria in terms of being very treatable immediately, uh, not requiring anything new in terms of R&D. Um, but we have, when we listen to our, our families, heard that they would like to, as I was talking about yesterday, like, about, like to know about things where we're quite certain that it's going to affect their child early on in childhood. Uh, so no ambiguity in that dimension, uh, but where the treatments might be things like treatment for epilepsy, where it wouldn't be a cure, but ongoing treatment or things like uh, early therapies. And so we've built that into the group two. So that's an optional module if you want to think about it um, in terms of being able to give them those choices. Um, as we've done this, we've onboarded uh, both the obstetricians, the pediatricians, the general pediatricians, and I said the subspecialists in all of these different areas, uh, especially for the group two conditions. We do know that we have very good natural history data as well as information on the alleles, and we've actually done the test in terms of test validation for the studies, being able to take affected individuals and run them through and make sure we didn't miss diagnoses. So we've done all of those in terms of the checks and balances before launch. Um, and for those who are interested, I'm, I'm happy to go into detail about the different conditions we have in V1 and V2, but we've gone forward with that. Um, as we've done this, like I said, we've been uh, tried to meet as many of the WHO criteria as we could in terms of um, what would fulfill, uh, you know, things that are treatable and how treatable they were for the group one conditions. Um, and as I said, from a technical point of view, there were a few conditions that I'd like to be able to include, but for very technical reasons in terms of sequence interpretation or issues in terms of pseudogenes, we have excluded over time. So we've gone to that level of specificity. Um, as we did this and as we decided those conditions, we've also similarly used the Delphi method as others have described, and we required unanimity in terms of taking anything forward for the uh, panels that we've talked about. And these are, I, I don't think I said it before, but uh, this is a whole genome sequence backbone uh, with informatically being able to look at a subset of genes. And as I said, you can imagine V1 to V2 is simply a matter of unmasking additional genes as we go forward. And that was intentional to build in that flexibility. There are some limitations for those of you who really want to get down and dirty in terms of details. Uh, so we will be uh, uh, confirming independently any of the results. And so that confirmation is built hopefully into before anything goes back to a child. But for CNVs in particular, there's some DNA limitation requirements that using these newborn uh, screen blood spots will require us to go back and get an additional sample or a buccal swab. Um, so we've built that into the workflow for the things that we're doing as well. Um, so with this, uh, in terms of we have included uh, several conditions that are already on standard newborn screening, this actually affords us a checks and balance in terms of being able to ourselves see how, how well we're doing in terms of picking up uh, things that are biochemically detected as well, for instance. Uh, it also gives us the opportunity to see what biochemical is not picking up. And uh, just my own experience, I'll just share, we've had a lot of experience with large genomic studies. Some of you know I run a large SPARC study where we've got over three 325,000 people uh, within that one particular genetic study. And it was really eye-opening to me when we identified a 13-year-old male with autism where he had phenylketonuria that had been undiagnosed and missed in terms of his newborn screening. And so, you know, within this, we've uh, really tried to think hard in terms of the things that we could detect and be really, really robust with those things, but realizing their limitations and being able to complement uh, all the different things that we can. 
Um, with this, we will try and push ourselves in terms of things over time. Um, and we've talked about all sorts of things that are a little bit trickier, UPD, which is a little bit trickier for us to do. And so that won't be in the first tranche of things that we'll roll out, uh, but we're building in the ways of being able to, whether it's a relatively smaller uh, single exon deletions, for instance, uh, triplet repeats, uh, UPD, but other things that are technically more difficult, we're, we're building in that whole process. In the interest of time, I won't go through all of this in detail, but suffice it to say, uh, we've done a compare and contrast between all the different studies that the, the folks in the room have done, as well as others outside the room have proposed. Uh, and to a large extent, I would just assure you that we have a large alignment in terms of the things that we're considering, not surprisingly, but there are a few things that over time, I think will come to convergence. And as we have experience with uh, something that I forgot that someone else remembered, or they forgot that we remembered, but I think we'll uh, come to consensus with that over time. Um, as we think about these things, and, and I think about this in terms of who I'm referring these babies to, uh, just to realize that they go across a wide range of different providers. And so again, we've built in many different uh, folks to be able to receive these babies at that end. And as, we doing this, as we're doing this, there are many different things, but just to underscore, for instance, uh, some of these are pretty serious. They could include uh, transplants, bone marrow transplant. Um, so as we're doing this, we have built in second tier tests for many of these to confirm that they really truly are the correct diagnosis before before we'd go on to uh, these conditions. Um, as I said, for some of these, we haven't included neurodevelopmental conditions. For many of those, they will be, uh, as an example, recessive conditions where we may need phasing and need parent parental samples as we bring the babies back, or de novo mutations where we'll get parental samples, and we'll be including that as part of the study. That won't be on the parents to pay for any of that. Um, as we do this, let me just go forward quickly. Uh, in terms of the variants that we are reporting, there's, as you've heard, this sort of uh, tension between sensitivity and specificity, and we're getting down very specifically based on the second tier testing we can do in terms of confirmation and based on treatability. And so uh, just in the interest of time, I'll say there's a bit of a slide that we can do in terms of this. Uh, in general, we are avoiding variants of uncertain significance, but when there's high potential for benefit for the child in an orthogonal way of being able to confirm that, we will take a VUS that's leaning pathogenic, for instance, in conjunction in a receptive disorder with another allele that's path or likely path. Um, again, as I said, uh, when we're returning these results, we are actually going to return every single result with a real person. Um, so we'll be trying in terms of uh, all of those as relatively quick phone calls, as well as everything being in our Neometrics newborn screening system, as well as our EPIC EHR system, uh, but with the positive results obviously being returned study physicians, as well as study genetic counselors and providing those services. And as we go on from that, being able to have the social support, the family navigators, um, being able to plug people into family support groups uh, who can be a, a big sister, big brother, uh, as families are dealing with their new diagnoses. Um, so with this, uh, we're certainly doing this within the larger ecosystem that you've been hearing about and realizing that we're especially early on, hopefully learning from each other in these very early formative days, but also combining to a shared system where we can uh, hopefully transform the way the rust works in a good way in terms of being able to shorten that eight years in terms of getting something on to something much shorter than that. Um, as we're doing this, we are evaluating the impact, uh, and just to say both uh, in all dimensions, really thinking about both the medical impact, the impact on the family from a psychosocial point of view. We've got a list of standardized measures that we've used across many studies. Uh, we do these uh, that with REDCap basically, but can, that can be delivered on a phone, a tablet, or a computer. And just to show you uh, the data in terms of we've launched and we're actually doing this. Um, and so in terms of approaching individuals, uh, we're getting a, a, a number one, we get to about 91% of people before they get to discharge. So we're actually face-to-face -face being able to approach the vast majority of people. Of those people that we're able to approach, 71% of them are agreeing to either group one or group one and group two. So it's not everyone, but it's the majority of individuals. I'm not surprised by that number. It actually is reassuring to me that it's not higher, you know, too high. Like I wouldn't want it to be 95% because then I'd worry that maybe they're not quite getting it. And it's not too low in the sense that I think they're understanding what the potential benefit is. Um, as we're doing this, uh, I don't know if you can see the middle, but this is group one and group two, and the majority of individuals are saying, if we're going to do it, give me everything. Give me group one and group two. On the other hand, I think it's actually interesting that there are 13% of people who are agreeing to do this who say, no, just like, I'd like to get the core things. You know, that's good for me. Uh, and again, I think that just shows to the thoughtfulness and that people really are thinking about this as they're consenting to that process. 
Um, within this, uh, you can see that there may be a little bit of difference uh, by preferred language, English versus Spanish. Our numbers are not big enough yet for me to be convinced that there's going to be a statistically significant difference in that, uh, but we certainly are breaking down the data as we're analyzing it by socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, self-reported race, ethnicity, and, and we'll see if that changes. Um, so just in terms of the surveys to see how people are thinking, and, and again, we're trying to get feedback so that real time we can make this study better over time. Um, they do want to know about the studies, as others have said, I think Melissa said before, mainly for their baby. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, but on the other hand, I'll say that, you know, they also want to benefit the lower right hand corner um, so that other babies can benefit from the newborn screening. So I do think it's a very altruistic group of people. And many people say specifically, we want my community to benefit. We want to make sure that my community uh, is represented in terms of taking this forward. Um, with this, we were also interested in issues of privacy, and for the most part, everyone's fine with this being part of their medical records. Tiny little uh, lip in terms of disagree with that lower left being part of the medical records. And so that's something uh, we're still continuing to make sure that we're doing that well. And as we think about the way that we're consenting people in this whole workflow and whether it's enough time, I'd say we're largely uh, hitting the mark in terms of people feeling like, yeah, I had enough time to consider this. Um, and there are some people um, that are actually saying at the time of discharge, you know what, I haven't made up my mind yet. Um, we give them until 30 days of birth to be able to come back to us and say that they'd like to do it. And so we do have people that over time are saying that, uh, yeah, not quite yet, but you know, let me think about this a little more and I think that's great. So I'll just wrap up to say that it takes a, a team as all of us do to be able to make this work um, but really happy to specifically point out our New York State Department of Health team as well as our GeneDx diagnostic team uh, that I think just does a fabulous job in terms of the throughput, the interpretation and real partners in terms of thinking about how to move this forward. So thank you.